Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we'll continue on in our <clears throat> study of Ecclesiastes verse by verse with the thought of living a meaningful life. And I uh, trust it's been a help to you, trust it's been a blessing to you. It sure helped my heart to go through this book verse by verse and look at, at the different things that would help us to live a life that's not only enjoyable to ourselves, but most of all, the most important thing is that it's pleasing to our Savior. The Bible tells us that for His pleasure we are and were created. And the Bible tells us that you and I uh, need to try to live a life uh, pleasing to God. And really the first step to that is to be born again. We can't please God without being born again. We can't please God without having our sins forgiven. As Bill Jim talked this morning in Sunday school, there's no sin in the presence of God. And so therefore our fellowship and everything about our relationship to Him hinges around whether or not we've been forgiven of our sins, first and foremost, and been made the sons of God and into the family of God, born again into the family of God. But after that, if, if you're here this morning, you say, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm born again. I know for certain that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. That's great. That's wonderful. I want that for everybody here. You say, that's me. I'm born again. Well, the onus is still on us to live a life pleasing to God. There's a practical side to our life that we need to focus on in order to please our Savior. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We've been looking at chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes and all these different phrases uh, if we, as we've come down from verse 1 to verse 2, the Bible says in verse 1, though, to everything there is a, t a season <clears throat> and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. And as we've gone through Ecclesiastes and understanding that Solomon, uh, the writer here that God used to, to write this book and pen this book, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible uh, tells us, and it's a warning in Ecclesiastes, that if you and I are born again, and our heart turns away from God to follow after the things of this world, we'll come to the same conclusion Solomon came to in chapter 1, verse 1, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life and come to the end of it and say, well, that was a bunch of waste of time. I don't want that. I want my life to count for something in the sight of my Savior. So that when I stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ, there's things that come through of my works that have remained in gold and silver and precious stones that I can cast at His feet and worship Him for all of eternity for saving my wretched soul. I want that. I don't know about you, but I want that. However, if we allow our heart to turn, we'll come to that conclusion it's all vain. It's all empty. And if you're here this morning and you've never been born again, I plead with you, please don't die in your sin. Please don't die in your sin. That would be the ultimate meaningless life. Is to have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preached, to reject it, and to pass off the scene, and lift up your eyes being in torments. That will break my heart. But listen, more importantly... That breaks God's heart. Because right now, as we preach on that float in four different towns, right now the invitation is given, whosoever will, let him come. Let's pray this morning and we'll get started. Lord, we do love you. Father, we don't say that flippantly, and I know I start every prayer that way, but Lord, I want you to know I love you. And I thank you for being such a good God and a good Father and a good Savior. Lord, we thank you for every person that's made the effort to come out to Spring City Baptist Church this morning. I pray that you'll bless us all, Lord, with the reading of your word and the preaching of your word. And Lord, I pray every person's heart has been prepared to receive the word, that it would be effectual in our lives, and that we'd be doers and not just hearers, only deceiving our own selves. And Lord, we do pray if there's one here this morning who doesn't know you as their Savior. Lord, we pray that they would repent of their sins and trust you. And be given the free gift of salvation, Lord. We know that you'll do that if they'll turn and they'll call upon you. And I pray, Lord, that they would make that decision today. And Lord, then for the rest that are here and born again and part of your family and as a child of yours, I pray that we'll take heed, Lord, to this message. That we would be diligent, Lord, to, that our lives would be pleasing to you every single day that you allow us to live on this earth. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being kind to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we got down through uh, verse 2, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant. That's what we looked at last week. We looked at the preparations of planting. And when it becomes 
time to plant. And many of you that have gardens, if you think about it this way, if it becomes time to plant your garden, there's a certain season that you do that. And if the preparations haven't been made in the soil and in your own heart and in your own mind and in your schedule, it's never going to happen. And we saw that that was a picture of us uh, sowing the Word of God and trying to be hospitable to folks and, and, and prepare their hearts in some way through our kindness to receive the Word of God. And we know that we can't change a person's heart, but we can sure try to do everything we can to let them see the truth. Amen. And then this morning we're going to look at the last phrase of verse 2, and that is a time to pluck up. That which is planted. A time to pluck up that which is planted. The entire verse here in verse 2 has been dealing with the cycles of life and death. You look at that. Time to be born, a time to die. Time to plant. That's when the seed goes in the ground and it's going to spring forth and germinate. And a time to pluck up that which is planted. It's not necessarily harvest time. Although it can be applied there. But you know, as I I drove up Spring City Hill a couple weeks ago, I noticed... Uh, many of you know the, the Blankenships that live right down here. And they've always got that big garden spread out there beside their house. And I always like looking at it in the summertime because, boy, they work that thing. And they, I'm sure they get a bounty of vegetables and fruit out of that. But as I drove up a couple of months ago, I noticed that everything, all the dead stalks, all the dead plants, what was left there, they would pulled it all up. They would cleaned it all up into a pile. And they set a match to it. And as I read across this verse, that's what popped into my head, is that, that image of what they had done, all those things that had, had grown at the end of the season, they'd gone in and plucked up all that had been planted. And what they were doing is they're preparing it then for the next time that something's going to be planted. Because if you leave all that dead stuff there, when it comes time to plant again, it's all in the way. It's got to be moved out of the way. But we see this this entire verse is a a cycle of life and death, of growth and decline, of establishment and demolition. Any of you that have raised vegetable gardens, you know those gardens are not perennial. In other words, you have to plant them every single year. They don't just come back on their own. There's work, there's effort, there's time, there's energy put into making that garden and making it grow. We understand that. Vegetable gardens aren't printed, they've got to be planted each year. But also, not only after you've planted it and gone to all the work of putting it in the ground and letting the Lord give the increase, and then you go out and you harvest all that, but after all that's done, there's still work to be accomplished. It's got to be cleared off and prepared for the next year. And you know, we, uh, we preach and uh, teach in these schools um, in the Tater lesson. If any of you have seen the Tater lesson, In the Tater lesson, we talk about our lives being gardens. And it takes a little bit of thought to think about that. But, you know, our lives are a lot like gardens. In the sense that there are influences outside from you and I that affect who we are as people. We talk about this with the taters and we say, you know, you got a tater sitting there. And we ask those kids, we say, okay, what is it that influences the growth of that tater? And they say, oh, sunlight, yeah, sunlight, water, yeah, water, soil, right, nutrients, all those things have an influence on that tater. And if one thing's missing, the growth of that tater is stunted, it's messed up. The same is true in my life and in your life. There's influences outside of our lives that, that shape us into the, uh, excuse me, into the individuals that we are. And the, the, the quality of those influences determine, if you will, what kind of tater we are. <laughs> If they're good influences, it'll help us be a good tater. If they're bad influences, we'll be a rotten tater. And nobody likes to be around rotten taters. Because rotten taters ruin everybody else around them. Now, listen, I know that's simple, it's elementary. But our lives, folks, are just like gardens. The things that influence us, the things that make us grow, are outside influences. And they have a great impact upon us. There's a time to plant, the Bible says... And a time to pluck up that which is planted. Now, I've been talking about dead things a little bit. But there's also something else you've got to pluck up out of your garden. And if you've ever raised a garden, you know what it is. It's a dirty little four-letter word called a weed. And if you don't get the weeds out of your garden, they will take over your garden. If you will, turn over to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. From 
First time the word garden is mentioned in the Bible, God planted one. Probably be good for you and I to plant one. <clears throat> Genesis 2, verse 8, the Bible says this. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of, the, out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Skip down to verse 15, the Bible says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, this is before the fall. This is before sin had entered into the world. This is before the curse that came upon this earth. And yet God had planted a garden and he put a man in that garden to dress and to keep it. In other words, to tend it, to give it order, to, to bring it underneath his submission. Amen. We're, folks, you're better than a tree. Okay, we'll make sure we're all on the same page there. God put Adam, the man he had formed, in his own image. He put him into the garden to dress and to keep the garden. Now, look down at chapter 3, verse 17. This is after the fall. Chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. What's that word right there? What is it? Thorns. Also, and thistles. What are, those are weeds, folks. Those are not pleasant to the eye. They are not pleasant to the touch. In fact, they're a nuisance. But why did thorns and thistles, why were they put on the earth? Why were they growing on the earth? Because of the sin of mankind. The Bible says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou take, and dust thou art. Unto dust thou shalt return. You realize if you go out here and you plow a section of ground and you clear it off and you till in the best organic matter to fertilize that garden plot and you get all that work done and it comes time to plant and you don't do anything, by the end of the summer, that ground will be full of weeds. Why? Because of the curse of this earth. Because of the curse of sin upon this earth. The same is true in my life and in your life. God put Adam in the garden to tend and to keep it. If our lives are like a garden, listen folks, it takes some tending and it's going to take some keeping to get the weeds out and to produce the fruit that God wants us to produce. Because if you and I in our lives, if we do nothing to cultivate our hearts spiritually, if you and I do nothing to keep the weeds out, if you and I do nothing to try to prune and to produce the fruit that God's looking for us to produce, if we do nothing, listen, the weeds of this world are going to take over your heart and my heart. It's going to take it over. That's just going to, it's going to happen that way. But if you and I will be diligent to tend and to keep the gardens of our heart, the gardens of our life, and keep the weeds out, Chances are, we'll produce the fruit that God wants us to produce. Chances are. Turn to Proverbs 24. Our text verse says there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. Anybody that has a vegetable garden that wants it to yield the fruit... And the produce that you want it to yield, you go through there and you pluck up those weeds periodically. Because if you don't, the weeds are going to choke out the good fruit. How often do you and I do that in our lives? How often do we sit back and we take account of our heart and we take account of our spiritual life and we say and we go through and we pluck out the weeds that don't need to be there so that the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God can grow and flourish in our own hearts? How many times do we do that? Proverbs 24. Verse 30, the Bible says, I went by the field of the slothful. That's a lazy person. <clears throat> I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. 
And lo, it was all grown over with what? With thorns. And with nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. The protection that was put around it was all crumbled down. Why? Because they're lazy. They're not tending to their garden. They're not tending to their vineyard. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to learn from other people's mistakes. Amen? It's a good thing to learn from our mistakes. Amen? Yet a little sleep, verse 33, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. You know what the Bible just told you and I? That if we just sit back in our life, listen, listen, listen. If we just sit back in our spiritual life, and we just fold our hands, and we close our eyes, and we just drift off into a nap, that the weeds of this world are going to overtake us. The weeds of this world are going to overtake us. The, the walls that we've built around our heart to keep the world out is going to crumble. And eventually people are going to walk by us and look at us and say, I better not do what that person did. They got destroyed. I better be diligent and prudent to keep my garden in good shape. To keep those weeds plucked out of there. To keep the stone wall up and around so that the world can't get in. How much spiritual maintenance are we doing on our lives, folks? The Bible says we're to pluck up those things that shouldn't be there. Pluck them up. Get them out. The dead things. There's, there's two things we need to try to get out of our gardens. Number one's the dead things. If you will, I'll go over to, um, to Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9. The dead things that need to be plucked out of our spiritual gardens, out of the gardens of our heart. The dead things, Hebrews 9, verse 14. The Bible says, right here we are on the blood, Brother Jim. Let's look at verse 13. The Bible says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Chapter 6 of Hebrews, just back a couple pages. Chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Hebrews. Talking about dead things. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from what? Dead works. What is dead works? They're sins. The Bible calls that dead works. It's deadness. When you and I sin, we spiritually die. There's death in sin. (laughs) The wages of sin is death. There's death there. Those are dead works. And the Bible says we're to pluck that junk up out of our lives. Get it out of there. 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But... If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us. Well, Jesus Christ, you turn to him. Listen, you turn to him with a repentant heart and you say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry my sins put you on the cross. Would you forgive me? He says, yep. You're clean. <laughs> Plucks him right out of there. But you know, after, and, and we talked about this this morning, positionally with God. Once you and I are born again, once we're saved, when God looks at us, all he sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We don't don't commit sin anymore, even though we do commit sin. In God's eyes, we don't commit sin anymore because we've had the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our lives, and we've had his righteousness imputed and given unto us. That ought to thrill your heart, folks. Listen, every day, every week, I fall short of pleasing my Savior as I ought to. That's sin. And yet every day and every week that I do that, God the Father can look at me and say, I don't see anything. Jesus' blood's still there. (laughs) He's still sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He's okay. And the devil comes to stand before God and say, did you not see what he just did? Did you not hear what he just said? And God said, nope, 
I didn't, because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. You ever had that happen in your heart? You ever had God pluck out all that dead junk out of there and cleanse you from all unrighteousness? If you hadn't, they'd be a good day to do it. The offer still stands. Turn over, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. You know what? After you and I are saved, then it's, it's up to us to keep our, our lives clean, keep ourselves clean. Say, so how do I plug up the dead things out of my life, Pastor? Well, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. The Bible says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto what? Unto sin. That means whenever the desire comes, which is still present in this flesh, and until our bodies are made perfect, we're going to have that desire to sin. But that means when that desire to sin comes, you say, No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to think that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to watch that. You say, no. Reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin. But, the verse goes on, but alive, the Bible says, unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12. What's the first two words of verse 12? Let not. You know who's that, who that's commanded to? You and I individually. And it's our choice. The Bible says, let not. Sin, therefore, reign. Who's on the throne of your life? Well, we can just we can preach every message in the Bible out of this. Who's on the throne of your life? Are you or Jesus? If Jesus is, it won't be a problem to let not sin reign in your bodies because somebody else is on the throne. But if you're on the throne and I'm on the throne of my life, we're going to have a big problem with this. The Bible says, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body that you should obey it. Who do you obey, God or man? In the lusts thereof, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't lend your hands unto sin. Don't lend your eyes unto sin. Don't lend your ears unto sin. Don't lend your mouth unto sin. Listen, don't lend your heart unto sin. Don't lend your feet unto sin. Yield not your members unto sin. In other words, everything we do, everything we say, everything we think, everything we look at, everything we listen to ought to bring glory to God. If it's not, it's a dead work. And we need to go in there and pluck it out. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. How are we doing? How do we pluck up those dead things? Well, we make the, listen, we make the conscious choice. I'm not going to let my lust take over me. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. It's a choice. Make the choice. I'm not going to do it. No matter how often the desires come, no matter how often the opportunity presents itself, I'm not going to do it. Plucking up. Getting those desires out of there. Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 1. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Verse 5. Mortify, therefore, that means reckon them dead. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. All those members down through there. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of, of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Verse 8, what's the first two words? <laughs> but now, if you're born again, you've been forgiven of all that mess. So, this is to you. But now... You also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. 
Lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. We have become a new creature in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 5, 17. So I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that is cre- that created him. Where there is either Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. This is the fruit we ought to be, we ought to be bearing. Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you're also called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of God, uh, I'm sorry, word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord, and whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You see what's happening in that chapter? There's got to be some things plucked up in the first part of that chapter so that the fruit of God and the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit can flourish and grow. But all that dead junk, all that sin, listen, it's got to get pulled out of there. Otherwise, it's going to choke it. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, don't turn over there. The Bible says to cast down imaginations. That's where the war is won or lost is in our minds. We're either going to cast down those imaginations and those evil thoughts and those things that pop into our head that our flesh wants to do. We're either going to cast them down or we're going to yield to them. It's one of the two. How do you pluck that out of there? As soon as that comes, cast it down. Start thinking about something about Jesus Christ. Start, start praising Him. Start singing a song of praise. My sins are gone. <laughs> That'd be a good one to sing. They're underneath the blood. That thought that I just had is underneath the blood. Hallelujah. It changed our perception. Help us pluck those things out of there. I wrote this down in my notes. <clears throat> you might get a kick out of it. You ever, you ever gone through your garden to weed out those weeds? You ever gone through there to do that? And you reach down and you get a hold of that weed and, and you do right. You get right down there at the base of it. You get right down at the base and you pull and all that comes off in your hand is what's growing up. The, 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 the roots never come out. You ever been there? I've been there. That's frustrating, isn't it? Then you got to dig in there and get that root ball out of there. You know, there's something that that our modern technology has created, it's called Roundup. And when you spray, it doesn't matter what you sprayed on, when you spray Roundup on something, it dies all the way to the roots. You know what you and I need? We need some spiritual Roundup. Listen, because it's real easy to hide what the roots of that sin are producing in my life and your life. It's real easy just to hide that and take it away. But the root's still there. Hey, folks, we got to get to the root of the problem. we got to use some spiritual roundup. What is that? There's 66 books of it. You'll never run out. It'll kill the root, kill the desire. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. I'm just on the first point, and time's flying. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, verse 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Say, Pastor, i got a problem with my thought life. Commit your works unto the Lord. The Bible promises your thoughts will be established. If you're thinking about how to get the work of God done, you don't have time to think about all the other junk out there. Verse 4, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone that is proud and hard is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Verse 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is what? It's purged. It means it's cleared out of the way. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from what? 
Say, Pastor, I've got a sin problem. You know why you've got a sin problem? Because you don't fear God like you should. If we, if we would just think, whatever sin it is that so easily besets us, whatever sin it is that drags us down and keeps us from serving God as we ought to, if we would just think one time, what if I went ahead and committed that sin? What if God just killed me right there on the spot? That would change things. But no, we sin presumptuously. We sin, because, well, I'm under the blood, I'm under grace. I'm not going to go to hell for this. What if God kills you right there on the spot? He can do that, you know. That's, the fear, that's part of the fear of God. The other part of the fear of God is that we're, we're, we're angering our Savior who died for that sin. Instead, why don't we spend time plucking it out of there and getting it out of our heart? By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. The word of God, being the picture of truth, will purge our hearts. But it also says by mercy. Romans 2, 4 says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. The fact that you and I can be born again is nothing but the mercy of God. Not putting us in hell where we deserve to be. And surely, surely we would think... It, whatever sin it is that we like to commit, whatever it is, we would think that, well, Jesus died for that sin. I don't have to go to hell for that sin. Maybe I just shouldn't do that sin. <laughs> because it's going to anger my Heavenly Father. And I'm counting the sacrifice that my Savior laid down on the cross as an unholy thing because I'm just walking right over it and going on and doing whatever sin it is I want to commit anyway. And said, why don't we pluck that junk out of there? Why don't we spend some time spraying some spiritual roundup on it and kill the desire, kill the root? How much tendon are we doing in our gardens? The first thing we've got to get out of our gardens is dead things. The second things we've got to get out of our gardens are the weeds. The weeds have got to come out. Turn, if you will, to, uh, to Mark 4. This parable of the sower, this is, it's mentioned in all the Gospels. Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 14, this is Jesus' explanation of the, of the parable. He says, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown... But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, so endure before a time afterward when affliction and persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Verse 18, These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh, what's the Bible say? Unfruitful. That's a picture, folks, of what can happen in my life and in your life. That we allow the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, to choke out the word of God, in our lives, and you and I become altogether unfruitful. What is it? A bunch of weeds. A bunch of thorns we need to get out of there. Say, well, pastor, how do I pluck up those thorns? How do I get that stuff out of there? The Bible there named three things that are the thorns and the cares of the world. It named uh, the cares of this world. Philippians 4, 6 says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. How many times do you and I, and listen, I've done it this week. How many times do we face an instance in our life, and a situation in our life, and we start worrying about it, we start fretting about it, and we start biting our fingernails about it, and we start stressing about it. And the Bible says, be careful for nothing. What's that mean? Take that care to God and say, Lord, I need some help here. And I guarantee you, if you and I will do that, Immediately, the Bible says, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's the old saying, why pray when you can worry? 
That's a dumb statement, isn't it? But don't we do it every day? The deceit, I'm sorry, the cares of the world is a thorn. It's got to be plucked up, weeded out of our garden. Number two is the deceitfulness of riches. Well, 1 Timothy 6 tells us all about that. It says, godliness with contentment is great gain. It tells us the love of money is the root of all evil, which is why some, having coveted after, have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money's a stressor, isn't it? One of the leading causes of, uh, of problems in marriage is money. No matter young marriage, old marriage, no matter. Money. Money's a stressor. You got to have it to live, right? <laughs> Don't you know God can take care of us? He's promised to do that financially. Matthew 6, He promised to take care of us, give us the things that we need. If we'll seek Him first. So how do I pluck up that deceitfulness of riches? Be content with such things as you have. Well, that's an easy statement to say, isn't it? It's harder to live. But if we'll come to the point where we're content with such things as we have, it's plucking up that weed of the deceitfulness of riches. The third thorn there listed is the lust of other things entering in. The Bible says in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Don't love it. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Listen, we know these verses. These are simple verses. But how much tending to our gardens are we doing? How much plucking out of the weeds are we doing? How much clearing out are we trying to do every day? A second weed of life, the thorns, obviously, the cares and deceitfulness of riches and the lusts choke out. Another weed that we've got to root out, Hebrews chapter 12. Turn over there. Hebrews 12. I'm going to finish right here. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 15. The other weed we've got to get out right here in this verse. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of what? Bitterness. When you and I, as people, listen. When you and I, as people, allow the root of bitterness to spring up in our heart. Listen, we are, we are rendered completely ineffective to God at that point. Because it's sin. When bitterness springs up in our heart, there's no forgiveness. When bitterness springs up in our heart, there's pride. When bitterness springs up in our heart, there's no love for other people. We become selfish and self-centered. When that root of bitterness springs up, and look what the Bible says, and trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Do you see that word? That's serious, folks. Bitterness is a serious problem. And the reason that it springs up in our heart, that root grows, is because we let it. So, Pastor, I got done wrong by this person. I just, I ain't going to talk to him anymore. Well, that's bitterness. That's foolish. And really, from that point on, I believe until you get that out of your heart, you're going to be rendered ineffective for God. Well, you just don't know what they said to me. I don't. You just don't know how they treated me. I don't. Well, I didn't get asked to do this or this, that. You didn't. (laughs) Why is it that we get offended and we get bitter? The only reason is because we think we deserve something either we didn't get or we don't deserve something that we did get. That's the only reason. Listen, and we've got to root it out. We've got to reach in there. and We've got to pull that root of bitterness out. Otherwise, it's going to choke all the fruitfulness. Let's turn to um, a couple here. We'll, we'll finish. Turn over to, to 1 Peter 2 and 2 Corinthians 2. We'll be done. 1 Peter 2 and 2 Corinthians 2. You've got to get the weeds out of our life. This root of bitterness is a, is a deadly weed in the Christian's life. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 
First Peter chapter two and verse eighteen. We need to pluck out that root of bitterness, that weed of bitterness. First Peter two eighteen, the Bible says, Servants be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering how? Wrongfully. That means you don't deserve to suffer, but you suffer anyway. That means you didn't have it coming, but when it came, you just bear it. I talked about Richard Wormbrandt there Sunday night. I mean, those guys suffered wrongfully at the hand of the communists. They did. They, they, there's no reason for that. But they took it. And listen, they didn't allow the root of bitterness to spring up in their heart. And as you read more into that book, what happens is they start witnessing. Listen, they start witnessing to the communist guards that are torturing them. And the communist guards get saved. <laughs> Why? Because they see some Christians suffering wrongfully and taking it. And not getting bitter. And not trying to get revenge. And not trying to get even. Is that not a picture of Jesus Christ? As soon as they plucked his beard out, he could have said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. But he didn't. As soon as they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross, he could have said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not going through this. But he didn't. As soon as they stuck the spear in his side and gave him vinegar instead of water to drink. He could have said, you know what, forget you. I'm done with this. But he didn't. He allowed no bitterness to spring up in his heart. What's my excuse and your excuse? We don't have one. Verse 20, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? (laughs) If you had it coming and you take it patiently, good for you. You had it coming. But if when you do well... And suffer for it, you take it patiently. Look what the Bible says. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Aren't you glad he did that? That's our example. To not allow the root of bitterness to spring up in our hearts. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. But ye were as sheep going astray. But now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 4. The Bible says this, verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief and have not grieved me, I'm sorry, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrary wise ye ought rather to forgive him. Now, if you read the context of all this, that's talking about a brother that was overtaken in a sin and in a fault. We're to forgive them. Not easy to do. But we're to forgive them. If a brother or sister does you wrong, it's real easy to let that root of bitterness spring up. But contrary wise, listen, we're to forgive them. That's how the family stays together. To pull out that root of bitterness, get it out of our hearts, and throw it to the side. So the contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Look, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Do you know how Satan gets an advantage in a Christian's life? When a Christian says, I'm not going to forgive them. 
When a Christian lets that root of bitterness spring up in their heart, Satan says, Aha! They just cracked the door open. I've got an advantage now. The Bible says, For we're not ignorant of his devices. Probably the worst thing about that root of bitterness is we know it shouldn't be there. But yet, I'm afraid too many times, we tend, listen, we tend to the weeds in our heart more than we tend to trying to produce fruit for God. Say, no, I'm not going to let that little root of bitterness go. I like it. The Bible says, root it up. Pluck it up. Get it out of there. No, I, I like worrying about my problems. <laughs> Bible says, pluck it up. Get it out of there. No, I, I like my sin. Listen, the Bible says, pluck it up and get it out of there or we're ineffective for God. So time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Colossians 1, verse 14. Or verse, um, no, I'm sorry, verse 11. Colossians 1, verse 11 talks about being fruitful unto every good work. Is that your desire? You want to do that? You've got to pluck some things up. You've got to tend to that garden. You've got to get some thorns and thistles and weeds and roots out of there. 